So kia tu, kia mahi, and please uh, join me in welcoming uh, General Manager Strategic Relations and Planning of the New Zealand Rugby Union, Nigel Cass. Thanks, Alex. Uh, kia ora, um, good morning. Uh, Alex said in the introduction I'm General Manager of Strategic Relationships and Planning, but what I'm actually here to talk to you about this morning is um, uh, firstly the bid for and then the delivery of Rugby World Cup, and in particular the, uh, the value proposition that we created uh, but first to bid for the Cup and then um, it worked on through in terms of, of the delivery. Um, I was the project manager of the of the bid for uh, for Rugby World Cup back in 2005 um, and then I was what was known as General Manager of Tournament Services uh, for the organisation that delivered uh, Rugby World Cup. Uh, so it was my job to um, uh, pull together the team that ran 48 games of rugby and, and hosted the 20 teams. Uh, for those of you who went to fan zones and cities, um, my team worked with the cities to do that, um, worked with the cities to develop banner programs and so on. Um, I wasn't responsible for selling tickets, I wasn't responsible for counting money and, uh, and all those other things that are necessarily part of, the, of a, a, a tournament like Rugby World Cup. Um, I've got a bit to say, but um, because it's quite a long session, I'm going to show a couple of videos as well. So, um, if uh, if it's if the talk is getting a little tedious, then um, cheer yourself up. There's a, a really nice video at the end to uh, uh, to look forward to, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time for some um, for some questions at the end if if there are any. Just in terms of, of, a, of an outline and, and the, the whole idea of a, a value proposition, I think um, the thing that I'm most proud of in, in terms of Rugby World Cup is that we uh, spent a lot of time at the beginning of the bid process uh, defining a strategy which was consistent with both what we believed our strengths were, but also our values. Um, we ultimately were successful with that bid, but we didn't forget about the strategy, uh, those strengths and those values that became a core driving force for how we delivered the tournament. Um, and with a lot of really, really good people, I've got to say, and attention to detail, um, we ultimate, ultimately were able to deliver on that. And that's what I'll um, just touch on a bit as we go on through the presentation this morning. So just uh, for those of you who are not aware of the background, uh, Rugby World Cup uh, story in New Zealand really starts in, in 2002. We were supposed to jointly host the 2003 Rugby World Cup with Australia and um, uh, for those of you um, who were around in New Zealand at that time you may, might remember that we um, uh, lost those sub-hosting rights and there was a lot of fuss around that. Um, so naturally New Zealand Rugby was quite nervous about putting its hand up to, uh, to host the tournament. Again in the future we'd been fairly badly burnt. So there was a process that began in 2005, uh, firstly bidding and then planning for the tournament, and then on through until 2011 when we delivered it. And I'll just go through again, highlighting some of those value propositions, the process that we went through to develop those, um, and hopefully there are some lessons in there for for all of you in relation to your own businesses um, and organisations uh, promoting the outdoors. So just in terms of the uh, uh, the, the timeline and and, and, and key moments. Um, we put together a group in late 2004 to decide whether we should bid to host Rugby World Cup and the first key decision that we made from within New Zealand Rugby was that we didn't have the right people to make that decision. Um, it, it needed to be a, a decision that was embraced by a whole range of New Zealanders so we, we put together a group that included uh, Jim Bolger, former Prime Minister, uh, John Palmer who's the Chairman of Air New Zealand, uh, Rod McGeoch, an Australian who led the bid for the Sydney Olympics. Um, and a range of, of uh, rugby people to, to try and help us firstly determine whether we could bid and then determine the strategy to bid. So the first thing that we recognised is that we didn't have the skills, we needed to bring those in. That group did, 
its work. We managed to uh, convince government to be a, a, a partner, and on what was Friday the 13th, Black Friday, which we took to be a great omen for a bid from New Zealand, uh, we submitted our bid to the uh, International Rugby Board. Uh, a process of lobbying, further information, um, uh, gathering and, and so on went on, and we ultimately presented to the, to the IRB in November and were awarded the hosting rights. And that's when, you know, we, I um, distinctly remember sitting on a plane back from Ireland where the decision was made, thinking, OK, we've made all these promises, <laughs> now we've got uh, five and a half years to deliver on them. And, uh, and, and that was really about delivering on, on the value proposition that we had, uh, had put forward. What I'd like to do now is just um, show you a, a very short DVD, um, and this DVD uh, opened our final presentation to the International uh, Rugby Board um, in, in terms of why we should have a Rugby World Cup in New Zealand, and this DVD, more than anything else, uh, set up our bid in terms of its value proposition, um, and uh, unsurprisingly in some ways, the, the New Zealand environment and outdoors and the New Zealand people um, formed part of the proposition that we um, uh, we put to the rugby board, if it will play. Yeah. Okay. So we're trying to set the scene from the very outset that that um, uh, the whole of New Zealand was was the stadium, and uh, we were all rugby. That was what was going to be unique about a Rugby World Cup um, in New Zealand. So in terms of the challenges that we face, and I'm sure in your own businesses you face a, a myriad of challenges, but in terms of bidding for a Rugby World Cup, uh, the primary challenges for us were that we, we have very small stadia in New Zealand, um, and our infrastructure is pretty limited in terms of uh, an event of, of that scale. Um, we operated on an incredibly tight budget. Uh, you have to pay the, or we had to pay the International Rugby Board just under 100 million New Zealand dollars for the, the rights to host and the only money that we can earn off the tournament is selling tickets. Um, so um, we knew that the budget was always going to be tight. Um, our reputation, given the ho hosting rights debacle in 2002, was not great. So we had a challenge to overcome there, and we're at the bottom of the world. You know, uh, all we knew the finals and so on would be going out into the primary broadcast markets in the morning rather than in the evening. Um, so there was a, a lot for us to overcome. So what do we do about that? Well, the first thing, as I've already mentioned, was assembling the right team, and that that. That team was about the, the team that developed the strategy, but also the team that was going to present to the IRB. And the first name on that list in terms of presentation to the IRB, from our point of view, had to be the Prime Minister. Because we knew that um, if this was a bid from rugby, um, we could never succeed. So we had to look outside the organisation. And, um, and Helen Clark and her government were very, very supportive of that, um, uh, of that bid process. Uh, the next thing that we needed was um, uh, rugby icons who knew all the voters, and um, most of the uh, the people who vote on where a rugby world cup are held are uh, uh, 60 plus uh, year old males who've played rugby historically. So we thought we absolutely need um, Sir Colin Meads um, because he played rugby with most of them. Um, uh, 
Jock uh, Hobbs and Chris Mola to present the the, uh, the business case, and uh, Tana Umanga, who was the then captain of the All Blacks. So saying, um, we need we need the All Black captain, but more importantly for Tana, uh, we wanted a Pacific Islander um, because we're saying Rugby World Cups in New Zealand, but it's a it's a Rugby World Cup for the Pacific, and we knew that that, that um, uh, Tana could push that that button. Uh, we came up with the stadium of four million. This was basically to try and say it doesn't matter that we've got small rugby stadia because our whole country is a stadium. The other other bidders all had uh, stadia that could hold between 80 and 90,000 people and our largest stadium was, was uh, still to be built but it would, would hold 60,000 people and most of the grounds would hold somewhere between 15 and 30. Uh, so we said well that doesn't, that doesn't matter because from the moment uh, the fans and the players get off the plane they'll be in, in a stadium of, of four million people. Um, I've already mentioned that government support was important and in terms of bid strategy, uh, the personal approach. 26 votes for, for Rugby World Cup. You've only got to get 26 people to believe in you and vote for you. You don't have to convince the world's media. You don't have to convince the New Zealand public. You've just got to convince those 26 people. And I think for all of us in terms of our endeavours, just focusing on the audience that we're really trying to get to is, is, a, um, is a critical thing for for, for most of us in our business. In terms of why it was successful, um, ultimately it proved to be a good strategy. Uh, incredible in attention to detail. Um, Jock and Chris went around the world and talked individually to each of the, uh, the voting nations, the people who held those 26 votes. And I worked with a guy called Ron Polensky, a rugby historian, and did research on each of those nations and each of those voting individuals so that they could make comment um, about them in their presentation to them in their countries. So I'd show them a DVD if it was in Wales. The only photos that appeared in that presentation were of the Welsh scoring tries against the All Blacks. <laughs> now, no, no point highlighting um, uh, the, the, uh, the All Blacks and so on. Uh, when, when, they, when I went to um, Argentina, uh, Ron Polensky discovered for me that the Argentinian delegate on the IRB used to be a referee and when Jock was really in his rugby playing career, He'd refereed a provincial game in Argentina that when Jock was uh, was was there with the All Blacks, and so Jock introduced this presentation by saying, um, "I remember that day in Rosario when you were refereeing the game, you know, it's because uh, we'd done done the research." So he was he was able to do that. Uh, the night before the the final presentation in Dublin, we're a hotel in Dublin. I worked with Lion Breweries and got um, them to stock the bar in that hotel with. Um, with Steinlager and New Zealand wines, and uh, we got um, Brian Lahore and, and uh, Colin Meads to just happen to be in the house bar that night because we knew the delegates would convene there before they went for dinner, and they were just able to offer them beers from New Zealand in, in Dublin. You know, just set the scene um, for for our place. Um, we had to have a lot of resilience, and I'm sure with any good strategy, resilience is a key key factor. Um, the the Sunday before the final presentation, um, the the Sunday Star Times had a headline which said on, on, on its front page, which said New Zealand's bid for Rugby World Cup turns to custard. You know, they said that the, the, it was home and hose the Japanese were going to win. But what they forgot was that the um, the media ultimately didn't matter. It was what those 26 voters were going to do that that. Um, uh, that really counted, but you had to have uh, belief in the strategy and, and stick to it. And finally, um, we were incredibly lucky. Um, I managed the Lions Tour in 2005. It just it had been set on a schedule for something like 25 years that the Lions would tour in 2005, and it was just a luck that that gave us the, the opportunity to prove that we could run really big events. At the time, the Lions Tour was the biggest event that New Zealand had ever um, had ever hosted. I I think it generated something like $25, $26 million in revenue. Uh, we hosted the IRB at, at the test in Wellington. It was the, the most unseasonably fine three days that Wellington has ever had in the middle of winter. Uh, we flew the delegates out to Farakaha. You could see the South Island um, from the, the uh, Kaikoura coast. You know, it was, it was uh, um, just a magical piece of timing. We did it well, but we had some luck as well. And then ultimately uh, we were successful in November. Um, this, this photo here on the end from the weekend press 
Um, Jock Hobbs and Chris Moller, who, who led the bid, were sitting next to the Japanese, who, and they had decided that it would be appropriate for them not to uh, show too much emotion. Um, unfortunately, they forgot to tell the rest of us down the line, so we were all pretty <laughs> pleased when we'd, uh, we'd, we'd won. So anyway, we won the hosting rights, as I said, it came back on the plane, a high degree of nervousness. Uh, we got started in uh, 2006, working on a venue for the final. We'd made some commitments around an upgraded Eden Park, and some of you might remember that there was a lot of debate at that time as to whether there should be a, a waterfront stadium um, in Auckland, and the government made a commitment to the, to the uh, uh, Auckland Regional Council and Auckland City Council that they would underwrite all the costs of that waterfront stadium if the city and the region um, agreed to it. Uh, they, the city and the region collectively I think had to put in about $150 million, um, and all the other costs would be borne by government. Uh, they deliberated and decided that they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to put the stadium um, on, the, on the waterfront um, and that I can tell you took me most of 2006 just working on that one, one uh, project. Thankfully we had other people working on legal structures and the thing about life and the thing about Rugby World Cup was that organisationally it's very complex. I worked for this little organisation down the bottom here, Rugby New Zealand 2011, and we were beholden to all sorts of different organisations, the Rugby Union, the International Rugby Board, the government, and I think the absolutely key thing um, if we were going to deliver a successful Rugby World Cup was getting our strategy right. And that's what we spent um, a lot of uh, 2006 and 2007 doing. Uh, firstly, defining our, our strategy, and secondly, realising that in most things in life you don't have to, to learn it all yourself. Uh, you can go and um, copy and steal ideas off other people. Um, and so we were determined uh, to do a bit of that. In terms of a vision, uh, we said first and foremost we've got to deliver a great rugby tournament but ultimately if that was all we did we would have failed and we said that, that it has to be a great festival it has to encompass the whole country we, we bid on the basis of a stadium of 4 million, we've got to be, uh, um, be, be true to that and ultimately whether we've succeeded or not we can have all these range of, of uh, key performance indicators and so on but the true measure of success with something like a Rugby World Cup and I suspect for, for many of you who are involved in outdoor businesses, whether your customers believe you are successful is, is how they remember uh, the event. And so we said it's going to be the memories um, that matter in relation to uh, Rugby World Cup. Uh, we defined some strategic goals. Um, my team was responsible for, for the first of those goals because if you don't get the operational delivery right, everything else is kind of incidental because it, it, that will just overwhelm everything. We, uh, we needed to make a lot of money, so we needed capacity crowds. We wanted to inspire the festival and we wanted to leave some enduring benefits, both in terms of bricks and mortar, but also in terms of the attitudes of New Zealanders, uh, the experiences of the people, um, and so on. Um, really important for us to get the strategy right. In 2007, we started with uh, with five people in the organisation. Um, by the time we got to the tournament, uh, we had uh, just about 6,000 people working on Rugby World Cup, if you count the 5,500 volunteers, um, who in large part delivered um, the most significant bits of the operational delivery of the tournament. So really, really important that strategy was right um, in that context. And the other fundamental that we decided right at the outset was that you don't run the Rugby World Cup from Wellington. Um, Invercargill people run Rugby World Cup in Invercargill. Uh, Queenstown people hosting teams will, will host those teams. We've got to set the platform, set the direction, provide the training, but delivery happens um, locally. Um, I talked earlier about learning from others. Um, I was lucky enough to go to France and work on the World Cup there. Um, I ran seven games uh, during the, the, uh, the French World Cup. Uh, the French ran a great World Cup. It was uh, typically, typically French. Their CEO characterised it as they had a fantastic restaurant and a chaotic kitchen. 
um, which is which is pretty true actually. I, I ran a game in, in Montpellier and I um, uh, I'd arrive. I was the, what was called a match commissioner, so I was in charge of the game, but I didn't arrive until uh, sort of 48 hours before kickoff. And uh, and the local organising committee was supposed to have everything ready. Um, I arrived uh, the the day before the the game. Um, on that day, both teams visit the ground for what's called a captain's run, and um, the the local organiser there um, welcomed me and, and was very apologetic because the painters had just finished painting my office and it, so it, it smelt a, a lot of paint and so on and I wasn't too perturbed about that and I went with my interpreter out onto the field and there were no um, ground markings and no goalposts. And uh, you know this is the day before World Cup, and I, I said to the local organising uh, committee uh, chief, um, when do the goalposts and line markings go? And he, and he said to me, I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, we, we were um, we were we were very lucky because the first team due that day was the uh, the Tongan team, and they were coached by a Wellingtonian, um, as is the rugby world who I knew. So I was able to ring up. Um, Alice and say, um, sorry mate, there's not going to be any goal, we, we're confident we're going to have some line markings but there weren't going to be any goalposts. And he uh, he said, oh, it doesn't matter Nigel, we're only going to play bull rush. <laughs> so so if, it, if it had been a team like the Urbex or any of the European teams, we'd have been in, um, in a lot of trouble. But the, you know, there was a, that was the French French way, sort of five minutes before kickoff, everything was done, everything was organised and they ran a, um, a fantastic tournament. But I came away from that thinking, we've got to get our ducks in a row a little more uh, structured than that, otherwise my, um, uh, my chance of getting through without a heart attack probably wouldn't have been great. We also had some people go and have a look at the FIFA World Cup in Germany, and the fantastic thing that they did was uh, fan zones. You know, they had 60,000 people at the final of the, the Football World Cup in Berlin, um, and they had a million people down the road at their fan zone watching the final. Um, so we thought, you know, in terms of a stadium of four million, the stadia, the actual g grounds where the, g the games are played are going to be a real small part of that. What happens in the city is going to be a massive part of that, and we really learned that from, um, from Germany. And finally, you just realise going out into the world that um, we don't have all the answers here, and we want New Zealand to look great, and the best way to get New Zealand to look great sometimes is to employ international experts to help you do that. And um, and so we um, we decided, while well, it might not be um, politically popular and popular in some sectors of the New Zealand public, that we were going to get the right people for the job, even if they weren't New Zealanders. Um, in 2008, focused on infrastructure. Um, we, we knew that we had to be true to a stadium of 4 million and so we wanted to spread games from the bottom of the South Island to the top of the North. Uh, the International Rugby Board incidentally wanted us to use um, less than 8 venues and we wanted to use I think originally 16. Um, so we had quite a process uh, to go through and we used what we called a warm tender. You know, we wanted to, to get money matted so we wanted people to put, put their best foot forward but we wanted to be talking to people so that they they got this concept of a stadium of four million. They got that it wasn't just about the rugby, it was about the festival and so on. So we, we set up regional, what we call regional coordination groups and we started talking to, uh, to the local authorities, local business groups, venues, rugby unions and so on who would deliver for us and managed a, a tender process but one that we were really engaged with them on. And the key in there was it was not just about the rugby, it was about festival and so on. Moving through to uh, 2009, really into the into the guts of of uh, uh, project management phase, uh, we confirmed that we would use at that time 13 um, match venues from Invercargill in the south to uh, to Whangarei in the north. But we didn't think that that was enough in terms of a stadium of four million. So we identified 10 centres that were smaller than those cities that would be uh, um, hosts to teams. So we took teams to places like Gisborne, um, to Ashburton, to Queenstown, um, to the Bay of Islands. Um, again, trying to just say that, yep, New Zealand truly is a stadium of four million. Now, and absolutely great in terms of somewhere like Ashburton. Um, their major claim to fame and event since before Rugby World Cup was that they'd hosted the World Ploughing Champs. 
and uh, yeah, really, really great that they can now say that they were part of the delivery of the third largest sporting event in the world, in, in Ashburton, you know, as can um, Gisborne and, and, and so on. Uh, during that time, the uh, new, new government had come into place, and, and the new government were far more actively engaged in terms of the festival opportunities, business leverage opportunities, than the previous government had. And so we worked very hard with them, and they uh, set up what they called the Real New Zealand Festival, um, and a whole range of, of uh, business development uh, leverage programs off Rugby World Cup, which we were really supportive of. Um, security around something like uh, Rugby World Cup is massive and uh, we, we started very early um, in, the, in the piece in terms of our security planning and uh, we knew that we had to generate um, 270 odd million dollars worth of, of ticket sales. You know, as I've already said, the large tour was the greatest um, event in New Zealand until that point, and something like 24 million um, dollars, so you know, 10 times the previous largest um, event in terms of the commercial revenue that we needed to generate, and we only had ticket sales to generate that off. So ticketing was a critical part of what we did in 2009. As we got closer, and this probably is a fundamental part of all, all of your businesses, um, uh, testing, trial and risk, you know, if, it, if it can go wrong, it probably will, and if you don't think it can go wrong, you're probably mistaken, it probably, there's probably a chance that, that it can. So um, we, um, we spent a lot of time um, thinking about um, the risk, what we were going to do about it and so on. We had incredibly detailed risk management um, processes in place. We shared these with government, we shared these with the IRB so that we're all on the same, um, the same page. Interestingly, I think this was from 2009 and the greatest risk that we thought at that time was that we wouldn't be able to recruit the people with the skills that we needed to do the job. You know, that was our, because it's just unprecedented in, in, um, um, in, in New Zealand. Uh, we set up what we called the uh, the Park Group, mainly because um, crap doesn't sound quite so <laughs> so good in this kind of co context. And this was a joint approach with government and the International Rugby Board, and it was all about meeting monthly uh, with um, with people, uh, senior commanders from the police, uh, the CEO of the the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, a whole range of other. Uh, Key, key people and just making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of how we're planning uh, uh, the delivery of the tournaments. We could not afford for, for one party not to know what the other parties were doing and, and so on. Uh, we did a lot of work on what we called sector specific planning. So we got, uh, for example, the electricity sector in and, and um, sat down and said, uh, you know, how bad would a winter have to be for the hydro lakes to be low um, that would put the um, the power supply into to Rugby World Cup venues in jeopardy, and what will you do if the if we do have a bad winter and the lakes are low to ensure that we don't lose power? Um, we worked with with uh, Vector in in Auckland because they control the two. This, there's um, one major and one minor gas line into Auckland, and we said, so if the major gas line goes out, how can you ensure that we don't lose gas at Eden Park? Um, because uh, we need to ensure that after the, the hospitals and other essential services from our side that the, um, uh, the, the tournament uh, can go on. And in interestingly, two weeks after the tournament, that we lost the main gas line into Auckland. Um, so you know, that, that could well have been um, uh, tested. We did work with all the lines companies in terms of the, the, the power supply and fitted backup generators into all our venues and, and, um, and so on. And just spent an enormous amount of time on policy, desktop exercises, and desktop exercises at the coalface, so with the, the people who would have to do these things um, in, in reality. Um, and then obviously we had the first of the Christchurch earthquakes, which we um, we thought we had uh, we'd been in incredibly fortunate. Um, there was no meaningful impact for for Rugby World Cup. Uh, during the intervening time between the first earthquake and the second earthquake, I led a group and we we uh, developed a, a match uh, reallocation policy. So we said if we lost a venue, what would we do? Where would the matches go? And we did that across all the 13 venues. It's fair to say that that policy was. Pretty 
predicated on losing a venue for a game rather than losing a venue for the entire tournament. Um, but then the, the second earthquake hit um, and uh, probably the toughest job I've ever had to do in my working life, the week after the earthquake, I um, had to go to Christchurch to meet uh, the mayor and a range of other um, uh, other people to try and make an assessment as to whether the tournament uh, could go on in Christchurch. Um, and they were desperate, absolutely desperate, as you can appreciate, for some good news. Um, and driving through the city to go to, to look at the stadium, I was praying that the stadium would be destroyed badly. To, because you knew if this, even if the stadium was in great shape, there was no way we could run a Rugby World Cup in that city. There just so much damage to all the infrastructure that we needed. Um, we, we got to the got to the venue and you didn't have to be an engineer to know that, that we weren't going to run a Rugby World Cup there. The bottom photo with the blue seats is uh, QE2, uh, that was our main training venue, and then you know, the, that's a shot straight outside um, uh, AOI Stadium um, and, it, and it, was, it was in really bad, bad shape. So we, we worked through a process to, to reallocate those games. Uh, we had to refund $22 million worth of tickets that we'd already sold. Um, it's the largest refund of tickets in any event, um, uh, global event that's that, that's ever happened. And then we had to go about the task of of reselling those tickets um, into the uh, reallocated um, reallocated venues. And not straightforward to to reallocate um, rugby or cup matches. You have to work out schedules which are going to work for the teams. Uh, Sky didn't have enough broadcast infrastructure to to go to other and uh, other venues. They you know they, they use massively expensive and, um, and complicated broadcast trucks. So it was um, a, a complicated exercise working that through. And then we got to, uh, thankfully, got to 2011. And 2011 uh, really is just all about the detail. It really is. It, all the, uh, the little things uh, do collectively add up and really, um, really do matter. Um, I mentioned earlier about engaging the right people. Um, we, in, in 2011, employed an Australian company uh, to develop and manage the opening ceremony for us. Our brief to that company was, was all about iconic New Zealand. It, this has to portray us. Um, this has to be a, a, a defining New Zealand moment. But in terms of the people with the expertise to deliver that for us, uh, the, we believe that our company out of, uh, out of Sydney and Australia were the best um, best place uh, to do that and present our country in a way that was the least risk for the tournament. Um, I employed a company out of Chicago in the States to, uh, to manage what we called spectator services. So if any of you went to games and you saw the, uh, the volunteers in their, their sort of teal jackets, uh, hopefully smiling at you and telling you uh, the, the right gate to go on and so on, they were operating to a plan developed by a, a company from, uh, uh, from Chicago. Um, their training was developed by that company from Chicago. And, uh, and one of the legacies is that we now have got a whole range of resources from that company that we can use in New Zealand uh, going forward. And finally, the, the uh, sports presentation, all the music, all the things that happened around the games, again, that was a, uh, a company out of Australia that helped us with it. Uh, again, an incredibly New Zealand-centric brief. Like we said, we only want to hear New Zealand ground announcers, they've got to have a Kiwi accent. Um, you know, they, uh, we want uh, uh, Māori culture to feature very, very strongly so the um, teams to field when the teams came out it was an original piece compo composed by Gareth Farr um, and then we had um, Pukaia players, um, Māori Pukaia players welcome, welcoming the, play, uh, the teams out, out onto field. So very New Zealand feel but it was delivered um, in terms of the, the, the delivery by an Australian company. Um, it was really critical to us that everybody working on Rugby World Cup was seen as one team and so we came up with this Team 2011 concept and all of us wore the same uniform. So um, from, from Martin Sneddon down we were all 
of trooping around the place in, in teal jackets and, and uh, the volunteer uniform. We were all part of the, uh, the same team. There wasn't a paid workforce and a volunteer work, workforce. We were all the uh, uh, Team 2011 who were going to deliver Rugby World Cup. Um, when you have five and a half thousand volunteers, um, the simplicity and quality of training is critical and we um, developed online training modules which again are part of the legacy for Rugby World Cup to, to bring all those um, volunteers up to speed in terms of what they needed to do. Um, and a critical part actually of my job in 2011 was just to try and protect that delivery team from the politics because everybody from the Prime Minister down had a really keen interest in Rugby World Cup and a keen interest in what they saw as things going well and things going badly and so on. And I needed all these people to be focused on delivery, not on worrying about politics. So we needed a team of people who were focused on the politics, focused on going across to the, the Beehive on a weekly basis, going across to Dublin to talk to the the IRB and, and, and manage that side of things. If we um, fast forward then to, to, uh, to tournament time, um, and I think the key messages and the key things probably in the delivery of your business, uh, cl clear command and control, everybody knowing who makes, who does what and, and who makes the decisions, um, and knowing uh, what really matters. You know, our head of, um, head of security had a, um, had a saying which was um, always walk to a fight. And um, uh, you know, what, what he meant by that was that um, if, if you rush in, you probably will do some, some, uh, um, uh, some silly things. And if you just breathe through the nose a bit and, and, uh, and, and take the time that you've got available, it's often easier to make the decisions with a degree of clarity. And uh, we needed to be really uh, well aware that, that people are in times of stress uh, don't always operate as um, effectively as they, as they do when they're not stressed. So we, you know, we've done a lot of desktop planning and so on, but we need to be really well aware of that at, at tournament time. I won't dwell on this, but it was incredibly complicated. We had a, a, a main operations centre in Auckland that was integrated with the police, was integrated with the defence force, uh, with Auckland city, um, uh, wider government agencies and, and so on. And um, so I, um, I, I ended up going to a lot of games of, of rugby during Rugby World Cup, but ultimately I was in charge of running the main main operations centre and being the, uh, the, the, the person who, who uh, would have got the call if things had started to unravel um, and uh, thankfully I didn't get, get, uh, get too many calls. Um, in relation to tournament time, uh, we always said we had to start fantastically well and on opening night at the venue, in terms of the opening ceremony and so on, we started fantastically well. It was a great uh, way to open uh, Rugby World Cup. The, the opening ceremony we, we, we believe was, was fantastic, um, it was a good game of rugby and so on, but um, out in the wider city, particularly on the waterfront in Auckland, there were a whole range of, of issues, mainly brought about through the, their success actually. It was a beautiful night in Auckland and they just had seriously underestimated the number of people who would seek to go downtown. And so I had to uh, try and ring fence that and have a team of people working with Auckland City to, to deal with that, but uh, we had five more games of rugby to run that weekend. Now we couldn't sit there and, and uh, all, all go into endless meetings to talk about what had happened on Auckland's waterfront. We needed to keep running uh, rugby, rugby World Cup. Um, for any of you running anything these days, massive information overload. You know, everything is, is, uh, that's happening in the public domain is being um, photographed, everything is being videoed, uh, everything is being tweeted, um, uh, texted, it, it's out there on Facebook before any traditional media have got hold of it. And you have to manage that flow of information. I'd be in uh, VIP lounges in, at, at Eden Park and have ministers and, and at times the Prime Minister coming up to me and saying, um, I understand there are problems with the trains. I've just it's being being tweeted, and I've just been told you, you need really good information to, and authoritative information to go back um, to to people and keep people calm, basically, um, because there's just so much information um, flow out there. And as the English team found out in Queenstown, absolutely nothing uh, remains secret. 
things. So you, you might as well not um, have any illusions about that. You know, e everybody's carrying a video camera in, in their pocket. Um, so uh, you know, we, we, you, need, you need to be operating on on that basis. Um, running an event like Rugby World Cup 54 days, um, it did start to go very well, and you do get into that kind of groove, and you really do need to. And I, I suspect this is the case with many of your businesses. You need to constantly guard against complacency. Just because you've done it many, many times before doesn't mean it can't still go wrong. And on the last night, the night of the final, uh, we lost power at Kingsland, which is the suburb in which Eden Park sits, and we lost power for three hours in the afternoon of, of the final. And we'd had a range of huge range of contingency plans to deal with that, but you know, if we hadn't been continually practicing those contingency plans right up to the final, uh, we might have been exposed. Ultimately, we were we were successful, and this is the uh, uh, the parade in Wellington with uh, Richie and the the volunteers and and uh, and thousands of fans. So why were we really successful? Just very briefly, in terms of key success factors. Um, Firstly, we energised the stadium of four million, and if we look at if you look at our organisation, um, we had a, a senior management team of four, and uh, Martin, as our CEO, almost his sole job was energising the stadium of four million. You know, he left, let the other three of us go off and and sell tickets and and uh, run tournaments and, and 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 so on, and he focused on engaging with the New Zealand and international public on the stadium of four million and the festival and making sure that non-rugby fans saw this as, as something that they, they wanted to be part of. Um, it's really important in the lead up to a major event to be seen to be on track and again Martin had a critical role to, to play in relation to that. The, there was a, a natural cycle uh, with events where in the lead up to uh, uh, an event, we saw this with the London Olympics recently, the media particularly are looking for negative stories in the immediate lead up to the event. So if you look back to the London Olympics, fantastic games, but in the two or three weeks before that, we had media stories about how security was going to be a disaster, we had all sorts of stories about gridlock and how the bus lanes aren't working, and and uh, the, there's just a natural tendency, particularly for media, to look for, for, for bad stories, and that's what they're going to do, and so you, you need to constantly work at, at turning that around in the lead up. It's really important to start strongly, really hard to recover if, if, um, you know, if, if we not only had had uh, issues on the waterfront in Auckland but we'd had issues at the venue, it would have been very tough to, to uh, uh, recover from that. As I've said, never underestimate the, the power of the media and as I said, Mark, almost Martin's full-time job was managing that relationship and the relationship with the, uh, the New Zealand public. Um, volunteers were absolutely critical to the success of, of Rugby World Cup. That friendly face, that taste of of, um, of Kiwi. For us, it was about stepping outside the rugby typical rugby paradigm. We, if we were going to be true to a stadium of four million, Rugby World Cup had to be relevant to people who'd never dream of going to a normal rugby game. Uh, we, you know, we wanted people to go along and and put a bucket on their head and cheer for Romania if it was in in uh, in Palmerston North and, or wear the stars and stripes and and cheer for USA and in New Plymouth and, and and so on. And that that we hope uh, for many people was the first time that they'd ever been to the rugby. It was about being part of a, um, a, a world event and we had to make it look, look and feel uh, uh, a little different. And just to give you an idea of that, obviously temporary stands at Eden Park with huge banners. Uh, this is my five-year-old son on the way to the game, a game in, in Wellington. You know, and uh, my, my kids went to every game in Wellington, all with their faces painted and, and so on. And, and so did three quarters of the crowd. You know, people just adopted the team and and uh, and, and really took to that. Um, we we're really lucky with government, non-partisan political support. Um, local ownership of delivery, a key platform, but it was critical. Um, fan zones in Auckland and Wellington in particular, a waterfront in Auckland, there were issues there, but, but it, I'll, I'll show a DVD in a, minute, in a minute of the fan zone in Auckland on the night of the final. Absolutely unprecedented success. 
Um, nobody believed before Rugby World Cup that anybody would dream of walking to Eden Park um, from, from downtown Auckland, but on the night of the final, um, 41,000 people walked from downtown Auckland uh, to Eden Park, and um, 15,000 of those 41,000 people didn't have tickets to the game. They just wanted to go on the walk because that was part of, of uh, Rugby World Cup experience. Um, but it wasn't just about um, Auckland. You know, there was a fan zone in Waipukera. Um, if you drive through small town New Zealand, you know, dri drive through um, Hunterville and it was dressed up for, for Rugby World Cup. It was a, a critical part of it. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, the, the old adage is absolutely true. Practice does make perfect. You cannot practice enough um, because uh, you, you, the only way that you can instinctively deal with the issues that you face is if you've, you've uh, done it um, many, many times before. And ultimately, um, with all of these things, uh, you need an element of luck. Um, you know, we, we knew that we could do a great job of, of running a World Cup, but if the All Blacks didn't do well, um, New Zealanders view of how successful the tournament had been uh, would have been uh, influenced by that. Um, on opening night we had a, um, an opening ceremony that for those of you who, who, who were there or saw it on TV included a, um, a, sm a young boy flying um, through the air to, to grab a very um, large uh, rugby ball and uh, we knew that um, if the wind was greater than 25 knots that he wouldn't be able to fly, we wouldn't be able to do that. And, uh, and we knew, I think it was 17% of the days in September, on average, that we were going to get wind of, of greater than 25 knots. We obviously had pretty good contingency plans to cover if that, that um, couldn't happen.